Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. If you find value in what we do and you'd like to support the podcast, go to coffee.com, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash alone, or you can go to alonewithinvisiblepeople.com forward slash support us to find out more. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I'm here today with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and today's topic is how to build novel tie-ins using flash fiction and short stories. So before we get into today's topic, we're going to go ahead and talk about our weeks. Holly? Um, This week, I had a, a very simple goal, which was get Dead Man's Party ready for the final type in revision. And to do that, I needed to finish up the write-in revision, and then I had to build the focus outline. And I finished up my write-in revision on Monday, and uh, then it took me Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and just absolutely ground the crap out of me to do my focus outline, but I got it. I got it, and I was thinking, I was so fried by the time it was done. Because it's, that's the whole monastery process where all you're doing is you are sitting there and you are remembering the book from having read it, but not looking at the book at any point and then writing down your line for scene sentences and from, from memory as you remember the story and as it needs to become. And it's brutal. It is absolutely for brutal. For you. For you, it was brutal. For some people... Yeah. Like, um, for me with Glass House and for me with uh, Leaving Wanda Lucia, it was amazing. It was one of my favorite parts. And uh-huh. a couple other people said that in, in How to Revise Your Novel. So, it, again, it's that weird thing where we're all different. Right. But, yeah, you you were just... Oh, it was grinding the crap out of me. But see, the thing is, the book was just so desperately broken because it changed four different times. So when you're doing the focus outline, you're writing the book in outline form as it should be as it should be is a really long way from where it started out (laughs) and I had to keep falling into the story and figuring out what was happening and I finally got there and I ended up with uh, what was it 36 uh, I think think 30 around 36 lines for scenes for 36 chapters which will make it longer than the final book by a little bit um, even without the fact that I always run long anyway but I'm really happy with what I got. I, I read through it afterwards, and it was like, holy crap, I can't believe how much better this is. I was going to say, when you, you were you were so frustrated, and you're like, I'm, I'm going to print it out, and then you printed it out, and you were like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it, it was like reading it on the page and actually following it, You, it, it seemed to make the last four days totally worth it. Yeah, yeah, it was grueling. It was really just brutal but at the end of it oh my god I cannot wait to do the type in on this book which is <laughs> next week <laughs> do you think you'll get it finished within the week oh not a chance absolutely <laughs> not because I'm going to end up adding 10 to, to 10 to 20,000 words to the book uh, not even including just the fact that there are some things that I have to completely rewrite because I started in the wrong place and yeah. oh god no no absolutely no way it's going to take me probably a month to get this done yeah, but I mean, a month to get Dead Man's Party fixed, yes, entirely fixed and, and added yeah. new parts. Yeah, that that's not a bad timeline. No, <laughs> my week I I finished lesson five. Um, I think last week I talked about having to redo the SFRs, and then lesson five is you're finding out what matters in then going through all of those SFRs, which is sentence for revision. And you're finding the conflicts and why they matter. Which, again, like every lesson, even though I've done this now, this will be my second one that I'm actually finishing. But every lesson pulls these things out of your brain and you realize like, oh, okay, well, this is how much better I can make this part. You know, and and knowing 
what how what matters about your story even though when you started it it might have been one thing when you finish it you found other meanings yeah. and i have three main protagonists and each of them um plus the villain i found like all of them had their own what matters which was cool um and then there's the overarching theme that of, of what actually does matter yeah. Then I finished lesson six as well, which was going through the conflicts and brainstorming ways to make them better. That was a lot of fun. I was really, really looking forward to doing that. There are a couple where I just left question marks because I've got so many freaking notes. My revision, I know I told you, my revision is now over an inch thick. <laughs> All of the revision notes. And that's not including the 52 extra revision notes that I have in my little notebook. <laughs> so yeah it's a lot but and again I wanted to say too that not everybody's going to go through this because not everybody like my leaving one to Lucia was a much simpler story it was a much less complex world and story and it there was far less um build up because I'm building a series mm -hmm. so everybody's revision isn't going to be over an inch thick at lesson six right <laughs> you know and plus a lot of that is going to be the first half is going to be notes the second half is going to be fixing plus a lot of it is going to be like your one b's going through <laughs> and really finding all the errors um and then lesson seven yesterday i started the world worksheets which lesson seven is like props gimmicks world that sort of yeah, stuff. yeah i love that stuff, stuff. yeah and just, like, I got through 11 or 12 sets, because I'm doing the world, which is where you start. And just on the first two, like, just after I had finished the first two, I'd already found a major characteristic of the villain that only happens in a certain spot, and for a damn good reason. And then I found that the second set had been criminally underused. I had just, just like completely and utterly neglected to use this set. And then as I went on, as I checked the world, like each scene, each different setting, I was like, in my head, I thought, oh, well, I don't need to do this one. It's just a bookstore. Oh, I don't need to do this one. It's just <laughs> a cafe. No, no, because the cafe that Misty goes to is completely different than the, the the restaurant or spot that, you know, Tracy and her mother-in-law and her husband go to. Mm -hmm. So there's different atmosphere. There's different philosophies. There, and, and with the different philosophy of each set, you're going to have a different mindset, the, a different way the character acts. Yeah. And different things that can happen there. Simply yeah. because the place is di different, therefore... Different yeah. things can happen there that can happen any place else. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And when I put down, so there's there's one scene that happens in particular. And I found going through these worlds, too, going through the worlds and paying attention to all this stuff, I found there was so much crazy juxtaposition happening that, like, one scene of Misty is juxtaposed to one scene of Tracy. And a good writer, or, or I'm not going to say that because I'm I'm... I was going to insult myself. I'm not going to insult myself. <laughs> um, I caught the fact that I could use these as a way to show parallel lives that, that don't look anything alike on, on the setting and mm -hmm. how they handle things differently. But at the, at the main core, maybe there's some similarities. Yeah. But there is one scene that I wrote where as I was discovering the world, and part of the thing that you talk about is like how to find out what things happen on a regular basis in these places. Um, I was like, holy shit, this one character is such a douchebag. <laughs> because of the way he handled a particular situation, because of, of how he set a certain thing up, I could not believe, and yet I could, because it just, I didn't really know that character that well mm -hmm. but the way things played out was intentional in a way and when i saw that i was like holy shit man this just <laughs> makes everything so much deeper it's amazing yeah, it's, you, uh, just <sighs> your right brain is so smart 
and it puts so much stuff on the page that you don't see there. And then you go, go back through and you discover what you've created. And if you know what you're looking for, it just freaking blows you away. Yeah. 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 And what's, what's amazing to me is that this, this course is basically like your, your decades of, of work. So like I'm cutting down by taking this course repeatedly i'm cutting down on years possibly decades myself of learning through trial and error yeah. it's like i'm i'm making myself better by what i'm putting into the class because you get what you put into it so if you you know like with um the first time i went through it with glass house i didn't have to ask it but i didn't even get halfway through so i didn't learn as much but i i oh man I'm sorry, and this is I told I already said this in the in the um in the podcast forums or no this was the How to Revise Your Novel forums. I'm like, I'll try not to go on and on about my week, but <laughs> like when you it you're a writing nerd, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. we, and people who are listening to this are most likely writing nerds. Yes. So when you find something that works, and it continuously works in all of these really cool ways, you want to share it with your friends. You want to talk about it with your other writing nerd <laughs> buddies, and it's like. I just really wanted to. <laughs> I'm just yeah. so happy. But yeah, so that was that was my week. So um, let's get into today's topic, which is how to build novel tie-ins using flash fiction and short stories. And Holly, you've created a worksheet yes. uh, specifically for this. So this is actually a workshop. Yeah. So okay. download your worksheet, print it off, get your pen not pencil, get your pen, and we're going to go ahead and do some stuff today. And Becky and I have already filled out our worksheets so yeah. that we can go through what we've gotten. So you want to pause and do your stuff? Yeah, and we have been requested to say pause okay. after we, and I, I, I feel really bad because she requested this before and then we did another <laughs> workshop and we didn't do it. Okay. So, so yeah, let's, let's try to remember to say pause. Okay. Okay. P A W S or P A U S. -E? Uh, well, knowing us, it's probably cat pause. <laughs> yes. So every time we say pause, no, we'll just say meow. meow. Pause, pause, meow. <laughs> let's not do that. That's entirely too cute and people will get annoyed with us. <laughs> um, I don't care. Yes. Not I will cat be people. <laughs> Okay, so let me just go ahead and and give you, give you the kind of the concept of what we're doing here. Um, when you write a long book and you want to create some little short stories surrounding it, or um, a little uh, short series, or um, flash fiction. And you want to use these smaller things as giveaways or um, as 99 cent stories to promote the bigger book. You need to have something that is good enough that people will read it and go, oh man, I want to read more of this. It can't be something you half-ass. It can't be something you just kind of throw out there and say, well, you know, eh, it's, it's just a freebie. No, it isn't because you only get one chance to make a first impression. This is also really, really good if you're still building your world and you want to have like these little mini stories that like Holly said, you can still give away, use as snippets to, to, to start drawing people into your blog and into your story or sell for 99 cents, which like I, I came up with a couple of stories and I have a note here to do this for my other characters. <laughs> and I have like, I wanted to keep going, but I had just done the entire day on my world. And also, uh, uh we had some stressful stuff on, on my end. And yeah. then, um, so I didn't finish up the entire worksheet, but I'm going to, and I'm going to be using this over and over and over again. Um, you can absolutely use this on a world that you're building right now to help develop the characters that you, that you have kind of like in your book and then write their side stories. And then as you're going through your book, maybe revising or write, writing more, you can kind of hint at the side story that you're going to be putting out because that. Since I'm doing a revision right now, that's how I'm using this. I'm going to put outside stories for these characters, little nerdy side stories for, for people who love my book to mm -hmm. go find and be like, ah, I remember that from the book. 
Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's the concept of what we're doing here, is you are building extended pieces of a novel that you either are writing or have written, and you are doing this awesome thing where you are spinning out tie-ins, okay? Um, and we are focusing specifically here today on flash fiction and short stories. And the top end of a short story for this, you want to figure as about 6,000 words. Because anything longer than that, you're going to want to sell for more than 99 cents. Yeah. Um, so the concept here is that you do have something written. You have your world building written. Um, you have a novel written. You have the first half of a novel written. You have some hard drive zombie that you are trying to summon back to life. And yes. you want to, you want to create smaller stories to show you what the potential for the bigger story is. And this, I mean, there are a lot of different ways you can use this workshop. Yeah, seriously. Like even if you're unsure, even if you've only got like one small story, like Holly said, like it's a 6,000 word story, freaking download this and try it out, you mm -hmm. know, because it's, it, it, at what's the worst that can happen? You develop a character. Like seriously, that's, that's great. No, well, I will, I will even say, um, I did not feel like going through my, any of my novels yesterday. I didn't feel like, um, I was just brain dead. I really was. Yeah. And I had, I had finished the Dead Man's Party revision, um, or the, the line for scene. And, and your Ohio novel's been banging you in the head oh with a sledgehammer. Oh, my God. And you are it, actively ignoring it. Yes. I was, I was in the monastery uh, in the, the forums and ignoring getting hammered on the head by Dead Man's Party or um, by um, the Ohio, Ohio novel, novel, which was throwing all of this cool new shit I could do when I do the revision for that at my head as I was trying to do this. And I knew I had to build this work worksheet. And after I built the worksheet, I knew I had to fill it out. And I, I was just fried. So I did MSU. Mm -hmm. I made shit up. Yeah. There is no novel related to this thing. And by the end of the time I had filled out the damn worksheet, now I want to write the book. Yeah. So if you... You can even use this to come up with ideas for novels that you never even considered. Yeah, and just as a note, too, Holly and I both had really, really, not shit days, but incredibly intensely stressful freaking days yesterday, mm -hmm. okay? And we, at the end of the night, we were both doing this at almost midnight. I think it was like 1130 or something yeah. that we were sitting down doing our worksheets. We were tired. We didn't want to do them, really. And by doing them, we both got inspired by what we wrote. Yeah, I was so ripped up, I wanted to outline a book. <laughs> Good God. I mean, seriously, we are both writing junkies. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's, to have a day like the day I had yesterday, and it just went on all damn day. And you know, then, supposed to. Yeah. yeah, yeah, oh, it was, it was stressful right up until the time that I sat down to, to fill out the worksheet. I was just, I was not wound down. I was just fried. And still, still got this stuff I love. Okay, so what you're going to be looking at here, you are going to be focusing on characters. These are protagonists and antagonists. Now, protagonists and antagonists are not necessarily heroes and villains. They can be um, just two people on different sides of an argument or two people on different sides, a different with different objectives that kind of get in the way of each other's objectives. The One of the most eye-opening little tiny drops that you've put into something, and I think it was How to Think Sideways, was when you mentioned that the antagonist of the book can be the protagonist of the scene. Yeah. Yeah. And I have several places in here where that happens. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. God. So tons of them in Dead Man's Party. Yeah. If, if you have a villain's point of view, he is the protagonist of that scene, most likely. Mm -hmm. So, like, that just is another tiny little shift in your brain that helps writers get the scenes right right is that when you have and in my case with dead man's party when you have a villain and he is an honest to god horrible horrible person um but he is the hero of his own story in his eyes he is awesome and he need he is well i mean he is narcissistic and he has done just terrible things to un 
counted numbers of people, but he is his own hero. And he is doing the things to to make his vision of the world come to life. And uh, from the scenes from his point of view, it's very important that I show that. Okay, so then uh, the next thing you are looking at after characters, which is your protagonists and your antagonists, you are going to be looking at conflicts, especially secondary conflicts. This is in the thing that you have written, if you have something written. Um, you are not looking for the main story conflict of that story because ideally you start and end that story with that conflict completed. What you're looking for is secondary stuff. Like um, you mentioned that the heroine of the story is um, had a best friend that she lost track of 25 years ago. The, the heroine who lost her best friend 25 years ago was just something you mentioned in passing. It wasn't important. It didn't, it didn't alter the flow of the story. It was just kind of this little loss that made her a little bit more human in one scene where she thought of something and she briefly thought of her best friend who she'd lost track of, didn't know where she was anymore. And then you move on and you never picked that back up again. And the more you write, the more of this stuff starts working itself into your fiction. Yeah. And the longer you write, and I mean by that word count, um, the more of this stuff starts working itself into your fiction. The next thing that you are going to be looking for is settings. Now, these are the, the, all of the different places. It's not like just the setting is your world. It is the setting is a coffee shop in your world, which like, like Becky mentioned, or yeah. uh, the setting is somebody's yacht, or the setting is the basement that you, when you are six years old, are absolutely terrified to walk down into because the only light for it is a pull chain that's in the basement and you're not damn tall enough to reach it. So it's, the basement is always dark and you know there's something down there. I, I, I have a weird quirk. Okay. This, setting, this, is, this is me in real life. Um, when I go into bathrooms and I have no idea why I do it, public bathrooms, I will take a picture of the floor. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's it's just the weirdest thing. I have probably since uh, I was a teenager, anytime I went into a new bathroom that I hadn't been in before, I would take a picture of the floor. So I have probably hundreds of those sitting on my hard drive. It's, it, I, <laughs> this is such a weird thing to admit to people on a podcast because I have no <laughs> idea how many people are listening to this. And if you hear a click, <laughs> I, I usually mute the sound because I don't want anybody to think I'm taking like a selfie in the bathroom oh, or God, some yeah. really weird Seriously. picture. Because it's literally just the floor. And I almost never do it if there's somebody else in there because I don't, it's, that's a private area. But right. that's something like, that's a setting and that's something weird. Like you could be sitting in a bathroom and hearing somebody's phone go click and you're like, what the fuck are they taking a picture of? Yeah. <laughs> and you like, hope that when you look creepy. up in the stall, there's not a camera leaning over yes. at you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. Okay. Um, so then after settings, you have twist. And twist is the change that makes the story matter. But you might have some smaller things in there that can become twists. Twist is a complicated concept. We are not going to get into it too much today. Um, but it's why you're writing the story in the first place. If you guys are interested in us doing a mini-sode or a full episode on twists, let us know in the um, either show notes or in the forum because I think that's one that we could cover because it means more than one thing. Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay, so with that said, this, these are the things you are looking for as you are reading through your existing manuscript or the things you're trying to come up with if you are using this as a, <laughs> as a just making shit up. Uh, let me see what I can get doing this with nothing, nothing already written thing. Okay. Um, and with that then, uh, again, 500 words to 6,000 words is the length of the story that you're looking to write. With that, I will get into the workshop unless there is anything else you want to say. Yes, um, actually there is. I wanted to mention that this, this was a question specifically asked by Chris, who is a member in our um, forums in the podcast forum, she's a member of Holly's writing classes. She's got a whole bunch of the classes. And she asked specifically, you know, like, how do I use the how to write flash fiction that doesn't suck or the how to write short stories? How can I use those 
to create world like stories in my world i think she was asking or maybe she was asking something about building up stories i should have had her question yeah for promotion out. yeah yeah because it was a really really good question and as soon as i saw it i was like oh my god yes this and i i told leah about it leah leah is the one doing our transcriptions leah white if you guys want um transcriptions of the show we're going to start having them by the way and i'll talk about that later but i told leah about this and she's like oh my god that's a brilliant question so if this is something that you're interested in, remember Holly has a completely free how to write flash fiction course that doesn't suck. How to write flash fiction that doesn't <laughs> suck. Of course the course doesn't suck. Um, the course is, and again, if you're not interested in writing flash fiction, still take the free course, go through it because it teaches you more about writing than just flash fiction. Further, if you want to do short stories, remember Holly has how to write short stories. If that is your focus, if you, if you, I, I still, man, I still say go write, you know, flash fiction, go try out the course, you know, even <laughs> if it's not your thing, you can learn something from it. And if you're here listening to this podcast, you are a writer and you are a learner. So <laughs> go learn yourself. Um, yeah, go learn yourself something. But the how to write short stories is a small, I think it's like eight or nine lessons. Um, I looked it up, it looked like there was eight, but usually Holly throws in like, other things or something. So it might be eight or nine lessons. It's a smaller course. It's something that can help you intensify and make your short stories better. And again, this is something that you can use to create saleable items in your world that will help promote the book before it ever comes out. It'll promote your world. It's inexpensive. You know, people on Amazon, they like their 99 cent buys, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I just wanted to say that I had to get that in there because <laughs> it was an amazing question by Chris because it, it just was like, sometimes people ask these obvious things and it's like, oh my God, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. You yeah, know, because it's, that is such an important thing to know how to do yeah. is to spin stuff out of a world that can help you bring in people without really frustrating them because you, you, <laughs> the thing that I hate the most, and this is, this is one of my personal pet peeves, and there might be people that this doesn't bug, but if there is a writer I like and that writer has a short, a piece of short fiction um, that I find either in um, an anthology or that I buy as a 99 cent thing. And it is something along the lines of the first three chapters and a cliffhanger with, hey, you know, if you love this. Oh my God. Yeah, that, that will make me stop reading someone. So the yeah. objective here is not to create teasers. The objective here is to create full, complete pieces of fiction in 500 words, up to 6,000 words that you can can put out there that will make people say, oh my God, this was fantastic. Let me find more. Not, yeah. what do you mean it ends in a cliffhanger? That sucks. Yeah. I, just for me to go buy another, another thing. No, I, I, you can always hint towards more stories, mm -hmm. but yeah. And if, if you want to get an idea of flash fiction, if it's not your thing, if you haven't done it before, go listen to our last year's Halloween episode, we had a ton of great flash fiction from our listeners. You guys yeah. did an amazing job. We had a lot of fun with it. We're going to be doing it again and listen to the end for an announcement on that. <laughs> and um, I, I also wanted to say, pick up pick up anthologies. Like, I'm going to mention two people. Pick up any anthology by Stephen King. Mm -hmm. um, his short stories are a little bit longer. They tend to be. But Stephen King to me has always been a a true master of the short story he yeah. is incredible and uh darcy coates i have one of her i have two of her short story anthologies i've only just started it but i really like i really like the work so um yeah those are my mom do you have a uh, one or two suggestions for people to read for short stories oh, well i have one for flash fiction but it's mine and i feel a little iffy about mentioning no, it this However, is your podcast go ahead yeah which, it's, which it's one strange arrivals and yeah. it's 99 cents, and it is 10 flash fiction short stories. Let's get to this worksheet. With the kinds of stories that you're doing, you're looking for the history of the character, you are looking for, or, or you are looking to create something that gives the reader a, a, a past history of your character, or you are looking for the first disastrous meeting of future lovers, or you are looking for a small problem that that you can tie into a bigger problem that the the, the character can face in the novel. 
Or you can look at how the protagonist became who he is, or how the antagonist became who she is, or uh, you can introduce a a new setting, or you can introduce other characters. Oh my and- God! If you if you are having a problem getting into your head of your antagonist, this is a great way to do it because mm-hmm. you just make him the protagonist of. Obviously, he's the antagonist of your book. He's the villain. But if if he's coming out a little flat, if he's coming out a little one dimensional, a little Doctor No. <laughs> <laughs> If you got if your villain is coming off so super u- uber dimensional and you're not writing like a kids book where you want it to, this is a good way to dive in to that character's mind, past, like everything that we're gonna go into here, and figure out his perspective, his personality, his his um personal philosophies and stuff, and really figure out where he's coming from, so you can write him or her better. Yes, and then your readers are gonna want to find that out too. So this, this is not just stuff that will teach you more about your world and let you discover who these people are. This is stuff that you can then take out there because readers who become fans of the world are going to want to read it. Yeah. With that, I am going to now read the first question uh, on the worksheet and assume that you have it downloaded, printed out, you've got your pen ready, and that you are ready to go on this. And it is identify an important named character in your story, protagonist or antagonist. And each of these sheets is set up for just one character. The, the, you print off the whole, however many pages it is, I don't know, nine pages, I think, or something like that. Uh, it's, yeah, I think the entire thing was like nine, but I think I only had to print off six pages. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So you... It is just for one character, so if you want to do another character, print off another set of worksheets. Um, okay, and so. I just want to be contrarian for a second. Okay. Because I'm, I'm your daughter. It, you don't have to pick an important named character, because oh. I've got one in, in there that I was like, ooh, that guy is very suspicious. And then you can create a name for him. <laughs> nice. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. there you go. You didn't realize he was important. Yes, my contrarian daughter. Yes. Okay, so. Um, with that said, step two, you're going to, once you have chosen the character and have written down a name or the name or just a description of the character, if you're going to do what Becky did. Pause now and find that character that you want. And Mm -hmm. obviously, like mom said, you probably should name them though. (laughs) So go ahead and pause and then do that. And then when you're ready, hit play. All right. Okay. My answer is Lizzie Brown, age 27. Holy crap, you actually have a normal name. Yeah. (laughs) I was expecting something like Dragon Dankmeyer. (laughs) I have moved, moved beyond Dragon Dankmeyer. That is, that is, him and his purple pimp hat remain in my past. But you say Herrig, and when you read it, it's her og. (laughs) So it's like, it's, it just, I was like, ugh. (laughs) <laughs> your names your names are pretty crazy but um okay so mine is peter cavanaugh he was in glass house and he is in uh the fulton hills paranormal book the um house on andrews Ave. step two locate places this character mentions goes to or avoids in your existing story your these are setting that you are looking for and with that pause all right uh, I am now going to give you the stuff that now. Now remember, I don't have anything written for this, so I am simply MSU making shit yeah, up. She is making shit up, and that's something that you can do too. I thought this was really neat that she did this yeah. because it gives you two perspectives. She's making stuff up, and I am pulling from what I know of the character and what has been in the culture, the world book, and my two books. Okay, so what I found was the bakery on West Third, next to the laundromat. Um, Lizzie's best friend, Susan Wrigley's house across town. Uh, Lizzie's first grown-up apartment shared with Tad Wesley. The falling down mansion where Tad Wesley dumped her. Oh. Yeah. The, I'm guessing that's an avoid. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Um, the old covered bridge on Lanky Creek, which is, in quotation marks, haunted. The deteriorating bike path in East Bakerstown. The fancy dress and gown shop in North Street, Bakerstown. The that petting... would be an avoid for me. <laughs> exactly, me too. <laughs> the petting zoo in Fairhill Park. 
and the killer lap pool in Fairhill Park. The hell is a killer lap pool? Is it like people drown in the lap pool? Yes. That's no. what my that's what my Lovely. muse said. Yes. Because it, it, this thing, as I was writing it, and I was just, just throwing things on the page, it just kept getting darker and darker and darker in the back of my head. Is anyone surprised? <laughs> have you ever written a fluffy bunny story? No. <laughs> I think I have. Even your kids' stuff is, like, very dark. <laughs> okay, so my step two, again, I was pulling from things that I knew about Peter... Um, I was pulling from things that have been mentioned in previous books, and I found writing The House on Andrews Ave that I was accidentally, like, just totally, not accidentally, my muse was pulling stuff from Glass House that was just, I didn't even remember. I was just so amazed. Um, okay, so in East Fulton neighborhood where he, w he was growing up. Now, I know which ones these are, so he avoids that one. Um, East Fulton Grace Memorial Cemetery avoids mm -hmm. the kawahala litsudu park is one of the few areas that is available to the public and is kind of like part of where they make their money their tourist money cool i don't know if that's an avoider that's one that he goes to i do know however that he being the owner of the fulton hills paranormal society avoids active ghost settings he is always outside of the active area. And he avoids family, home, or hot spots. So wow. I'm assuming like all of these seem to be avoid. So I'm going to say he likes the Kawahala Lutsudu Park. Yeah, just, just so that there's one place in there that he goes to. Yeah. Okay, um, so let's go to the next question. This is step three. Identify the people in your existing story that this character mentions and his or her current relationship with each. Um, and that's, this is protagonists and antagonists. You want to include whether the, the relationship is a protagonist or antagonist relationship along with um, whatever you, you know, whatever else you come up with. Okay, so pause. All right, and we're back. Um, my, I got Susan Wrigley. The childhood best friend grown apart after Susan married a self-important jackass who <laughs> lives now in the prestigious North Hill neighborhood. Um, Tad Wesley, the boyfriend, dead of apparent suicide not long mm. after they broke up. But no one, no one can believe he killed himself. Okay. Um <laughs> Next is Lizzie. I'm starting, yeah, I'm starting to doubt Lizzie Brown here. <laughs> uh, Lizzie's fraternal twin, Eric, who is funny, popular, has a dark side. They used to be best friends, but over the past three years have grown distant. And then Lizzie's hated cousin, Elaine, who is gorgeous, popular, married to a rich guy, and cannot resist comparing her life to Lizzie's. Yeah. Oh, this cast of characters, man. Oh, yeah. Um, I got Misty uh, is his friend. Let me see it because I can't read my handwriting right now. Okay. But he wants more. He couldn't have her before as she was married and isn't having her now. Isn't moving on her. Isn't having her. Good grief. <laughs> isn't moving on her now while she's still vulnerable. Um, family. This family is neither Hiller, his family is neither Hiller nor Nuit. Now, those are terms for um, Fulton Hills. Hiller is somebody who has been, you know, generations and generations a Fulton Hills resident, you know. Yeah. And they typically know what gen they are. They'll be like, oh, I'm sixth gen. Oh, I'm seventh gen. Whatever. The Nuit are people who are rich and powerful and move to Fulton Hills and think that they deserve the respect that Hillers do. And ah. that is a term from the NoHo. <laughs> um, so his family are neither Hillers nor Nuit, uh, but they are ungodly rich and connected. His life changed in college and he's made choices. <laughs> so <laughs> I like the little pause before the word yeah. choices. <laughs> yeah. Uh, his twin sister. <laughs> he refers to her in the present. She's dead, but not gone. Tanya knows more than she lets on. 
she knows more than he knows she knows. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, I love Tanya, man. Victoria Gavin and he have a very old relationship stemming from his involvement with similar people. Um, I don't know what their story is, but they are very antagonistic towards each other. And the last one is Peter knows the author of the nonfiction book Tracy Picked Up, My Connected Child Dealings with the Dead and Your Child. We are now ready for step four. Identify successes and failures this character had before your story starts. Then briefly note how each of these got your character to the current point of your story. These are conflicts, okay, which, you know, again, is not arguments. Conflicts is obstacles in the path of the character's life that the character must overcome. Okay, so with that said, pause. All righty, and we're back. And um, I am going to start with a success. Uh, my character beat out her cousin for a local TV news reporter job <laughs> until Elaine married the station owner and suggested a conflict of interest in having the it hire family. Oh, my God. Yeah, okay. She had another success. She won the Fair Hill Summer Swim Meet three years running for breaststroke and high dive, but Tad Wesley hanged himself from the high dive. Good grief. Yes. Her next issue was a failure. She never dared to pet the goat in the Fair Hill Park petting zoo. His eyes scared her into thinking she could hear his thoughts. And, yeah, um, if you've ever looked at a goat, they have square pupils. It's really, mm. really creepy. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, had a, her family had a couple of pet goats, and uh, I got to look at them up close and pet them and everything, and their eyes scared the crap out of me because they were just <laughs> wrong. They were just Yeah, they're wrong. really, they're very bizarre. Wild Adventures in Valdosta now has goats, and I've pet them, and they're yeah. so sweet. <laughs> they are. They're, they're, they are smart, sweet animals, way, way brighter than sheep. Um, but they do really have weird eyes. And, yeah. and for her, when she looks into the eyes, she thinks she can hear their thoughts. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting a, a little feel here that my particular character might be a little off. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then there's one, a fourth one here I got. Her failure is she could not stand at midnight in the center of Lanky Bridge. She kept feeling something cold kissing her cheek. Her brother Eric succeeded. Now, this was one of those childhood dares that kids yeah. do where, oh, you can't go at midnight and stand in the middle of this covered bridge that we've got in the middle of, uh, of or at the edge, at the outskirts of town. You know, it runs over water. And, and you can't do this. I dare you. And she couldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. That is weird. Yeah. She felt something cold kissing her cheek. Okay. Your turn. Peter was brilliant in school. Extremely high IQ. Was in line four. And then I put some things in brackets because I didn't know really. Um, or parenthesis. Uh, brain surgeon or MIT or something, lawyer at Harvard. So I think I went with lawyer at Harvard. Um, but he was in line for full scholarship, and he left college. Um, his twin sister died while he was in college. She came to him, comes to him. His family does not believe this. Hates his chosen path. He walked away. All right. Um, and then one more. Peter has been trying for two years to get a business license for the Fulton Hills Paranormal Society. He's hobnobbed in the same circles as his family to their deep embarrassment. He finally got the approval and knows how, but isn't saying. Nice. Very, very nice. All right. So we are now down to step five. And I got to tell you, step five is writing the sentence. And the sentence cannot have more than 30 words in it. This is a hard rule. That, and there's a reason for this rule. It's not just... Yeah, I was going to say explain. Yeah, it's not just me being a pain in the ass. Yes, it you, is, but it's also a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be able to understand the concept of your story in 30 words. You have to be able to do this when you are talking to editors and agents and are pitching the story. You have to know exactly what the story is about, and it has to be tight. 
it. Think of it as an elevator pitch. Think of it as your story's elevator pitch. Right. If you, you're, you're in that elevator with the millionaire and he's like, okay, what's your idea? I'm here. 30 words or less. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to have everything important in those 30 words. So this is how you do that. It uh, is protagonist versus, which is your conflict, antagonist in a setting with a twist. So um, if you have not done this, you might want to listen to what we do first before the pause. But for I know a lot of my guys know how to write the sentence. Yeah. So, and again, this is something that we can do in a mini episode because... We've already explained how in-depth protagonists and antagonists can be, or mm -hmm. protagonists. I mean, it's the same thing with antagonists. Verses can be confusing. Setting setting is not just a place. Um, twist. It's not just a murder mystery twist. So if you guys want us to do a mini episode on packs, you know, protagonists, for antagonists, uh, conflict, twist, and setting, that's, that's how she's got it there, um, uh, let us know and we'll do like a mini-sode on it. Uh, we're going to say pause now for the folks who know how to write the sentence. And what you do is you get out your worksheets, you spread them out in front of you, you pull out the elements that are on them, and then you write uh, at least several sentences. Yeah, uh, I only did two because it was probably after midnight. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so you're not going to get a lot of examples here. You're going to get four. Okay, so pause. And we're back. Okay, um, my now I I am going to break this down for folks. So and the the worksheet breaks it down too. My protagonist is Lizzie Brown, thirteen years old. She is her, her versus is fear of the haunted Lanky Bridge. Now, yeah, note that Lizzie Brown in her information was twenty seven, so right. she has picked a different timeline. Right. So what I did was I moved back in time so that I could create a story for my readers uh, from when she was a kid that shows how she became who she becomes when the reader reads the novel. And this was apparently a key experience in her life. Okay, The antagonist, the kids who stood on the bridge alone, the ones who had successfully done this um, and who are now torturing her to go and do it, uh, the setting is this old covered bridge, this historic landmark. Ohio still has a lot of them. And for some reason, this is pull This was pulling in from the Ohio novel, which will not of get course. out of my head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the twist is that the bridge really is haunted and its ghost makes uh, Mark's Lizzie. I have to read my own writing there. <laughs> um, okay, so, and the sentence is, Lizzie, 13 and terrified, stands her ground on a local landmark bridge to prove her courage until the real the bridge's real ghost marks and claims her and my word count on that is 25 words your turn with a sentence okay i did count mine last night but they're all under 30 i just don't know how many so okay. before we scan them i'll count them and write it in the parenthesis next to it okay um so my protagonist i kind of wrote down a couple of different things my just like holly did she wrote down notes as to what they were and then changed the wording for the sentence so that's what i did my protagonist is haunted genius harvard dropout <laughs> it's kind of like my my summaration of him antagonist is the active spaces with ghost uh which you would think is a setting but the antagonist is the is is that place the active spaces with ghost the setting is during the investigation so it's that's again like like we said th this can be a little bit different and mm -hmm. weird um and the twist is uh, but must rush in to save his partner. So the sentence that I came up with, and this is not the past. This is actually going to end up, I guess, being in the future. Um, a haunted Harvard dropout is never a part of active rooms, but must rush in during an investigation to save the woman he loves. Very good. We're going to get back to one of mine, my second one. Okay, and this is... Susan Wrigley, 27, estranged friend of, friend of Lizzie. Um, the antagonist of this story is Lizzie Brown, suspected of a second lover's death. 
The setting is the refurbed mansion from Lizzie's sad past. Uh, the one that the first guy yeah, broke up with her in. Broke up with her in, right. Twist. Uh, the ghost who has claimed Lizzie kills the new love. Okay. Good grief. Yes. So Is this and, the ghost that was kissing her on the yes, bridge? Yes. That's the one. So possessive little shit. Yeah. So the sentence for this is private investigator Susan Wrigley makes a connection between ex friend Lizzie and a second boyfriend's apparent suicide, but only succeeds in clearing Lizzie, though she still thinks Lizzie guilty. And that's 28 words. <laughs> okay. Um, so my protagonist is, again, haunted Harvard dropout. Uh, the verses is must convince a business. Uh, I, I, I just kind of like, it's, it's not a real sentence, but must convince no ill intentions. And um, the antagonist is another haunted soul. The setting is seeking a business license, recluse, rich, that's that's kind of the, the setting, even though I think that the recluse and rich, I was so tired. The recluse and rich should have gone with antagonist. So I'm going to draw a little arrow up there. Sorry, guys. I was really tired last night. Um, the twist is to invest in his business. So a haunted Harvard dropout seeking a business license for his paranormal group must convince a rich recluse to back his cause, showing he has similar goals and intentions. Mine are pretty untwisty, un, you know, kind of on the, the, the face. Mm -hmm. But when I was thinking of these scenes in my head, I already had these really weird twists involved. Yeah. And it's, it's neat because when you write the sentence, you're getting the important stuff down. But your muse is like, oh, there's more to it, though. You know? And, and as you write these things these stories and these settings and these twists and stuff like I came up with stuff that's actually going to end up in the book yeah. <laughs> in the next book. I didn't come up with stories, but that's okay because these, these things are helping me with the next book. Exactly. Um, I will be going through this in, and, and my, my problem was I picked a major character. I will be going through this again and picking out two other characters mm -hmm. to redo this with. And come up with stories that I can can put out maybe at the same time as, as the book. So right. that there's little supplements. Yeah. So so that is essentially our workshop right there. What this is, is it does presuppose that you know how to write either 500 word flash fiction or that you know how to write short stories. And this is how you come up with the things that go into that flash fiction or those short stories. So, you know, the workshop can't cover that, but it does cover how to build the ideas, and this is where you do them. Okay, and before we get to the takeaway, because Holly says there's a there's a big, nice takeaway for you guys, I'm just going to yeah. remind you, you can follow us on the socials at A-I-A-R-W-I-P on Twitter, at Alone with Invisible People on Instagram, at Alone in a Room with Invisible People on Facebook. <laughs> Again, because I had to make it so difficult. <laughs> if you want to follow Holly, Holly's personal Instagram, it's just really cats, knitting, stuff like that. It's holly.lisle. That is, you know, holly.lisle. Um, I am R Gallardo. That's G-A-L-A-R-D-O on Instagram. Holly is Holly Lyle on Twitter. And I am Rebecca Gallardo on Twitter. Go to alonewithinvisiblepeople.com. We are going to have this download. Again, you don't have to give us your email. There's, there's nothing that you have to give us for the downloaded worksheet. It is absolutely free. Go to this week's episode and the download will be there. Uh, we also have transcripts for the first two episodes, Introductions and Inner Critic. We are trying to get transcripts out and done for our deaf community as well as for folks who just have listened to the episodes a couple of times and you want to go back and read certain parts it's great to have as an extra thing as kind of like a note you know it's almost like taking notes in class so transcriptions are awesome and I just wanted to give a shout out to Leah White she is my best friend she's an Aussie and she is doing this for us and it is absolutely amazing that she is helping us out 
And I would love to thank you too. Thank you, Leah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's she's just awesome. And if you guys are interested in do, in her doing transcription for you, we have her information on the site on the transcriptions, so you can contact her for um, any transcription needs. The best way to really interact with us is to join the community at hollyswritingclasses.com create a free account. You automatically get that how to write flash fiction that doesn't suck course and join us in the forums. It's, it's our podcast forums. You can ask us questions because clearly this, this whole episode stemmed yet again from another question. You guys letting us know what your problems are or what you're interested in or what you really want to learn how to do is going to help made the, make this podcast better for everybody because there are other people out there wondering the same thing that you are. It's a community of writing nerds. We That's have what a I'm lot of fun there. You've got writing nerds. Like I went on and on and on about the How to Revise Your Novel course in a bunch of these because I'm talking to you guys because you guys are my people. You guys are writing nerds. We are all writing nerds. And... God, you know, sometimes <laughs> people don't have that in real life, IRL. So you got to go online and find your people. And this is, if you are listening to this podcast, 99% sure that you are one of our people. So head into the forums. It's a free account. You get a whole bunch of really cool free stuff and you get a whole community that's yeah. got your back. And the reason I built the community was so I could talk to my people about writing. Yeah. The people who are as nerdy as I am about doing this stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you guys, this is not the only time that we talk about this stuff. This is not. We, we talk on the phone about our writing. We talk on, the, um, on Skype when we're working together about our writing. This is, mm -hmm. this is our life. We are true writing nerds. We talk about writing pretty much every day. So this is an amazing worksheet. I really, I just, and it's free. It's completely free. Again, go to the show notes, download the free download, try it out, give it a, give it a whirl. And Holly, what is the takeaway while I watch your cat clean his butt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're both getting a very good image of that. Uh, yes, thank you, Sheldon. Okay, so the takeaway here is Know what you want the story to accomplish. Now, you have to have your goal in mind. Um, whether it's giving new readers a chance to fall in love with a character or world, or giving current readers something to tide them over when a sequel is delayed, or just understanding your world better, or building a new character to fit into the world, you have a reason for writing any specific story. And the reason will change from story to story. So you have to know why you want to write the specific story that you are writing. And after you know, your, know, know why you're writing it, ask yourself how your story can accomplish that objective. And your right brain will help you out with that. It will tell you, well, you know, if we want to show that this person is haunted, but uh, haunted by a ghost, but... Uh, innocent of the crimes that, of which she's suspected, and this is going to play into the novel later, then you show how these things happen in the earlier stories. If you want to show how somebody became a villain, then you show that character's life, and you explain, well, this is the horrible stuff that happened to this guy, or this guy was just born bad. There's, yeah, there's a good example out there for Walking Dead fans, whether you're a fan of the comics or the, the television show, the governor was a huge character. And McFarlane did uh, an entire series, I think it was like two or four novels on the governor's life alone. And I haven't read them, I, they're on my to-buy list. Um, I've heard mixed reviews about it, but I loved that character. And he got his own series. So it's it's that same idea. You don't know what this could spawn. Right. Right. Exactly. And when you know what you want to write and why you want to write it and what you want to accomplish with the story when it's done, then write the story. You can do this. Okay, our writing nerds, I am just going to say, and, and Holly has uh, nicknamed you guys roomies, <laughs> which I love <laughs> because, you know, alone in a room with invisible people, well, we're all, we're all roomies. So I guess um, that's going to be my sign off is, <laughs> is you know, we, we love writing nerds. We love you guys. And um, you're our roomies. <laughs> yes. Go and, and do something awesome. And we will see you soon. <laughs>